Thank you very much for the invitation and for the introduction. Uh, I will speak about uh, drug toxicity, and uh, I have no uh, conflict of interest related specifically to this uh, presentation. Toxicity can occur in all compartments of the kidney, at the glomerular level, at the tubular level, uh, interstitial uh, level, and we have uh, the systemic effects of drug can have uh, effects on the, on the uh, kidney. Uh, the list of potential drugs is very large. On the left, we have a, a, a large study outside of the ICU, and on the right panel, it's a monocentric study in the ICU of all drugs which uh, may be uh, nephrotoxic. There's a big issue with uh, causality in uh, AKI and toxic AKI. When a patient arrives in the ICU, Creatinine drops because of uh, fluid loading and uh, dilution. And then after a while, creatinine rises. The patient has AKI. He may eventually have short-term mortality on uh, eventually long-term uh, consequences. First causality problem is AKI and consequences. Is it association or causality? And then we just saw all the causes of AKI and what is the causality between toxicity and AKI. And those relationships have very important implications because as we just saw in this uh, large epidemiological study which has been presented, uh, the hospital mortality odds ratio, sorry for the ratio, is uh, 2 to 6 when you develop AKI. And in that study, 15% of AKI episodes were drug-related. So if causality is true, then removing those drugs could have a big impact on hospital mortality. So this question is important. On the mechanism of AKI, uh, rather than pre-renal, renal, and post-renal, I prefer to see it this way. There are specific causes like trauma, thrombosis, where we already do all we can. We operate patients, we give anticoagulation, etc. There is not many improvement to be expected. Then we have systemic causes like shock, inflammation, infection. We already give vasopressors, we give uh, antibiotics, and again, I don't think there's much progress to be expected. And then the toxic, it's quite easy to improve it. We just have to see the benefits and the risks, and if the benefit-risk ratio is unfavorable, well, we just don't give the drug. So I'll, I'll go through a few drugs we use in the ICU. Starches has been known now for 20 years that they are toxic. Uh, surprisingly, it has never been shown that there's any benefit, and it took 20 years to kind of uh, uh, get that through. I'm not discussing the recent large trials uh, which show the, this toxicity, but it was already known for, for about 20 years. Uh, starches are now gone, I believe. Uh, that's a study we did uh, in 10 ICUs of our research network. Uh, we uh, noted all nephrotoxic medications from day one to day seven in the ICU. It's something we, we presented yesterday in 1,000 patients. And uh, only two patients receive starches in the ICU. So at least in our research networks, it, it's gone. So it's not a problem anymore. If we speak of uh, aminoglycosides, uh, that's the first uh, important paper with 360 patients who received aminoglycosides in the ICU. And 58% uh, developed AKI. Well, we can't conclude anything of that because there's no control group. We don't know if it's because of the shock and hypovolemia, etc. And surprisingly or not surprisingly, other nephrotoxics were very frequently involved, so we don't really know what's the, what's the thing. Uh, a more recent study uh, which matched patients, and that's the, the methodology which is needed, and they used a propensity score for doing the matching. Uh, briefly, you have a list of variables, I don't go into the details, which are risk factors for receiving an aminoglycoside. And for example, if 60% uh, of male received an aminoglycoside and only 40% of women. So being a man was a risk factor. And then you list all the risk factors. 
and through logistic regression, you can calculate the risk of getting an aminoglycoside. And then you match patient with the same risk of getting an aminoglycoside, but one received one and one did not. But they had the same risk. So it kind of mimics randomization in such type of epidemiologic studies. And uh, using this methodology, the results of those uh, authors is that aminoglycosides were not associated with a significant risk of AKI. Uh, 300 patients, but in any negative study, we never know if it's negative because there's no effect or if it's lack of uh, power. That's a large uh, Cochrane meta-analysis. The question is, when I use a beta-lactam antibiotic, if I add some aminoglycosides, is it beneficial or is it toxic? 69 studies, more than 7,000 patients. And, well, there's no benefit in terms of all-cause mortality or clinical failure rates to add the aminoglycoside to the uh, beta-lactam antibiotic in uh, septic patients. And interestingly, there was much more uh, nephrotoxicity when uh, an aminoglycoside was added, and the conclusion was don't use aminoglycosides on top of uh, beta-lactam antibiotics in septic patients. If we move to vancomycin, again, uh, say old-fashioned study, there's no control, so 20% develop AKI after vancomycin. Interestingly, only 11% had a methicillin-resistant uh, strain, so actually only 11% would eventually benefit of the drug. And uh, vancomycin through levels were an independent risk factor. Uh, that has been uh, discussed earlier. Uh, you can see it here, the higher the through levels, the higher the incidence of AKI. Uh, that can be related to the first talk. Vancomycin is very similar to Yoexol. It's a very good exogenous marker of glomerular filtration rate. And one cannot know if it's the cause or the consequence of AKI that the levels are increased. Um, there's a, an issue with drug associations, and that has been shown a while ago Aminoglycosides plus vancomycins may be even more nephrotoxic, but again, there's no uh, control group in this uh, study. There is a, uh, some very recent data on those type of uh, associations. That's a study with nearly 300 patients who all receive vancomycin to treat the gram-positive bacteria, and for the gram-negative, they either receive piperacillin tazobactam or cefepim and they were matched on uh, sepsis, ICU status, etc. And uh, the results are that clearly the uh, piperacillin tazobactam group in red had much more AKI than the cefepim group. And one could conclude that maybe vancomycin is not the problem and it's the piperacillin tazobactam which is the problem. Uh, until now we only s have seen epidemiological studies and there's always a difficulty for causality in such type of studies. Uh, with vancomycin, there are some randomized trials, and that's a meta-analysis of such randomized trials, and they mostly compare vancomycin with linezolid, and clearly there is more nephrotoxicity with vancomycin, so that is quite a high proof that, that there is some attributable nephrotoxicity. Now, if we move to iodinated contrast media, who thinks uh, iodinated contrast media is not nephrotoxic? Raise the hand. So we have three or four, five, okay. Uh, that's a study we, we performed in the, in the ICU, and we looked at AKI incidence in a group of patients receiving contrast and a control group. The control group had an intra hospital transport without contrast media. And in the unmatched data, you can see that you have an increase in uh, incidence of AKI if, if you receive contrast. That's the example with the Akin definition of AKI. And then we did a propensity score matching, as I explained to you earlier. And uh, when you match, there is no more attributable uh, 
uh, incidence of AKI, the difference is non-significant, whatever the, the definition of AKI you, you use. So it may be that there is no toxicity, or it could be low power. It's always the same issue. There are two other groups who uh, did the same type of work than we did. And uh, I, I thank the, the, the colleagues of, uh, of Houston and Miami who shared this individual patient data uh, with our group, and that's results we presented yesterday of a meta-analysis of those three trials to address this uh, <coughs> uh, low power question, these three epidemiological studies. So briefly, doing a standard meta-analysis, no uh, a priori hypothesis, we, we have no preconceived idea. When we pool the three studies here, we have 560 patients and the a posteriori interval, uh, confidence interval crosses one and so there's no toxicity even with 560 patients. Uh, maybe it's still low power, but uh, that's the best we could do. Actually, we don't start from a neutral point of view because all of you, except a few, said contrast is toxic. And uh, so we modeled that using an a priori odd ratio of 1.37. So we believe that there is some toxicity. And when we combine this a priori belief with the objective data, well, it's still not significant. And then we said, okay, but we, we don't believe a little bit. We believe strongly that it's toxic. And instead of using just the same amount in the first analysis, it's the same amount of information than the objective data. We said, okay, we, we put twice as much amount of information. So we're really convinced it's really toxic. But really, even when we do that, well, at posteriori, it's still not significant. And if you do it three times, it's not. If you do it four times, it's not. And actually, we, you need to do it at least five times uh, the, 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 the amount of information and belief to, to still be convinced that it's toxic. So I hope when you leave, you will believe it's not toxic or you're not rational, which is very human and acceptable. But Okay, so when we look at toxic uh, drugs one by one, that's one question, and that, that, that's what we've done until now. We've seen that sometimes association may come into play. In this large observational study we, we did in the, with a thousand patients, 60% um, of patients received at least one nephrotoxic drug, and 30% received at least two, and 60% developed AKI within seven days in the ICU. And uh, this is quite similar of what has been shown uh, earlier, what, what are the drugs involved. And uh, we matched the patients who developed AKI with those who did not develop AKI and looked what was their exposure to nephrotoxic drugs before. And we had like that 184 matched pairs, AKI versus no AKI and we measured the nephrotoxic burden in the days before. The burden was calculated as days, time, number of nephrotoxic drugs. So if I have one nephrotoxic drug for two days, it's two, and if I have two nephrotoxic drugs for one day, it's two as well. It's a limit, but that's how we, we counted it. And this nephrotoxic burden was a significant risk factor for, for AKI in this matched analysis. Um, so even if taken individually, some drugs probably are not as toxic as uh, we believe, like for example contrast media, uh, the, 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 the combination of drugs may still have a, have a, have a toxic effect. I come to my uh, conclusions, uh, which are uh, relatively simple. Starches, no benefit and harm. The story is over. Aminoglycosides, the benefit is probably overrated and they do harm. Vancomycin, there are some alternatives and it does harm. Contrast media, uh, the harm is probably overrated 
And uh, there is some benefit, even if it's not that much studied, I believe, in the ICU. Causality is a major issue, and we don't really have an answer to, to that question. And nephrotoxicity is a powerful way to potentially influence hospital mortality. And my belief is the only way to really give an answer to that question is to have some randomized intervention of a low-tox group uh, compared to usual care. And I would be pleased to work with people interested in that topic on defining what low-tox group could be, what would be acceptable and not. Uh, but I think there are sufficient arguments to, to perform such a trial in the future. Thank you very much for your attention.